And welcome to the Shaman's View. I'm Dr. Alberto Violdo, and today I want to share with you some of the ancient shamanic strategies for stepping into a new future. We all need a new future really badly. And the worst guide that you can have for the future is the past. So to dream a new future into being, we need to unburden ourselves from the past. We need to be able to shed the past the way the serpent sheds her skin. And there are four fates that we need to shed specifically. The shamans of the Andes that I trained with believed that we were, that death stalked us in four different ways, four deadly fates that had been selected for us by our family of origin, by the times that we lived in, by our lifestyles. And I want to share with you what these are and how we can begin to empty our cup to prepare for a new wine. Like Rumi, the poet Rumi says, empty the cup, prepare the cup for the wine. The wine, of course, is the great spirit, is the divine. So the four fates that have been selected for us are determined by the circumstances that we're born into, by the genetics that we inherited from our families, by the ways that we learn how to love, to love ourselves and to love others, by what we believed our journey in life was going to be about. Was it going to be about suffering, about getting rich, becoming famous, having, what is your work? What is it that you came here to do? And the fourth, of course, is what is your, your spiritual destiny, your spirituality. I remember being in the Amazon one time and a medicine woman that I was working with said to me, Alberto, death is stalking you in the same way that it stalked your mother and your father and your grandmother and your grandfather. And I had no idea what she was talking about. And then when I returned to the US, I went for a health checkup. And the very first thing that the doctor asked me was she, she said, tell me, how did, how did your grandmother die? What are the genetic predispositions? What are the illnesses that run in your family? Asking me the very same question that the medicine woman in the Amazon was asking me about except for the shaman, we're not tracking genetics and we believe that we can change the death that has been selected for you by your genes and by your family of origin. In fact, for the shaman, that's a default position. That's where you fall back on if you don't select a destiny for yourself. You fall back on your genetic fate, on your karmic fate, on the emotional fate, which is the way that you found love or did not find it in your family. So we need to find a new destiny for ourselves during these times of great crises. Not only a slightly more improved and more pleasant way of being in the world, but an entirely new destiny for humanity at this critical juncture that we're in. And we begin, of course, by selecting a new destiny for ourselves. This is what the work of the medicine wheel is about. This is the journey through the four steps of knowledge and power that the woman or man of wisdom takes to become empowered, to become an awakened being. And today we're going to take the first one of these steps together. It begins with the way of the serpent, of the great serpent. Now, I first heard about the serpent as a little boy when I heard that it was the snake in the garden that brought us that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I remember asking my Sunday school teacher, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with learning about good and evil? And she said, well, it was not good and evil that was a problem. It was the snake. Of course, the snake the serpent has always been associated with the feminine, with Eve, with the goddess Hera, with Aphrodite, 
So the goddess is always come protected by the snakes. And even in the Eastern traditions, you find the snake of the Kundalini. You find that the great sage Patanjali, who wrote the very first book on shamanism, and you can read about this in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, his lower part of his body is a snake. He is a snake human. He is one of the ancient beings that belonged to a former race that inhabited the earth that now have gone into the invisible world and they've taken on the forms of the great serpents that the Buddhists in Tibet call the Nagas, the great world protectors. This is that Euroboros that is swallowing his own tail or that Kundalini serpent of wisdom that begins to rise through our chakras. But the work of the serpent in the medicine wheel, the first time you go through the wheel, is to help you teach, to teach us how to shed the past the way the serpent sheds her skin, which is all at once. And not one scale at a time, the way that we've been trained to shed our past trauma, where we pick up, pick on the scale that's stuck the most so we can feel something. No, we want to shed it all at once, the way the serpent sheds her skin and end up with the soft new underbelly that makes us vulnerable, that we can be with our belly on the belly of the mother and feel her heartbeat and return back to the earth, return back to our mother, return back to the feminine and the ways of the feminine, feeling the protective embrace of our mother who never left us. This is the mother that will never leave us. Imagine what Western psychology would be like if it was founded on the fact that we have an eternal mother that is always looking out for us. There go all of our mommy and daddy issues as well, but particularly the mommy issues, because this is the great mother, and we only come back to her when we shed all of our history, because as we know, history repeats itself. So the best guide for the future is to empty yourself, to shed that old tight skin that no longer fits so that we can become that which we have been promised we could be. You know, when I was looking at, the, at our DNA legacy, it's interesting that biologists say that only four to five percent of your DNA codes for proteins. The other 95 percent is called junk DNA. Now we don't have anything in the body that's junk. There are no junk fingers or junk toes or junk limbs or junk anything. Why would we have 95 or 96 percent of our DNA be junk? Well some of it is the fossil record of evolution of who we have been and some of it curiously is also viral. These are the viruses that we've become immune to and it's in our, it's in our history, it's in our record. And we know that part of this is a chronicle of the history of evolution because when we are in our mother's womb we recapitulate the entire history of evolution of our species. We know that phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny. And I never get this order right if it's the other way around. But what it says is that as we develop from a single cell individual, fertilized egg, into a multi cell with trillions of cells in our body, that we go through the entire history of evolution looking like a lizard at one point, then getting two arms, two legs, ten fingers, ten toes, until we begin to look distinctly human. Now, a lot of that DNA is also our human capabilities, who we can evolve into very rapidly. It's all about expressing that part of our genetic code that is in password-protected regions. And we know that we can do that, in fact, that we must do that today. But in order to access 
this ge these genetic possibilities, we have to share our past history, the history of who we believe we are, of where we came from, even of what our name is. And it reminds me of the story of a, <coughs> of a Buddhist monk in Tibet that shows up at the monastery and the very first day of the monastery and then every one of the new students gets a razor blade to shave their heads. And the next day all of the, <coughs> all of the new students are there with shaved heads except for this one who's got long, long flowing hair. And they ask him, why didn't you shave your head? And he says, why should I? I shaved my mind. And this is what we do with the work of the serpent. We become empty. We become empty so that we can fill ourselves with the new wine and with the new nectar. And part of what we shed, all of what we shed, are the stories of who we believe we are. It's interesting when you're working with trauma, with people that have experienced trauma, and all of us have experienced trauma, and even if you didn't experience it directly, remember that trauma causes us to go into fight or flight and to produce the stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And cortisol and adrenaline go right through the placental barrier creating the belief structures that you inherit from your family while you're still in your mother's womb. Half of your personality, half of the neural networks in your brain for how you process experience. Is this danger? Is the universe supporting me? Is this person approving? All of this happens. 50% of this you learn before you leave your mother's womb. And these are the stories that we inherit in our family that turn into the family drama that we tend to reenact and recapitulate as we grow older. We recreate the same dramas with our partners and our bosses and our children. So all of this we need to empty ourselves from. We need to put those stories in the fire so we're no longer the product of a story that happened in our family, that runs in our family, but we are the storyteller. We're no longer an actor in a script that was written by our family of origin, but we're the script writer. We can write our own story. And the Andean shamans, when they're doing ceremony in the mountains, they do a despacho offering, which is a mandala. And in the south, we want to create a new mandala. But inside that mandala, there are two pieces of foil. There's a piece of gold foil and a piece of silver foil. And they are called the Cori Libro and the Colque Libro, the golden book and the silver book. And the legends say that one of these books comes already written and it must be edited. The other book is blank and the task is you need to do some editing in the one that's written. We need to clean it up. But you can't spend your whole life doing that. You need to get on with writing your new story, with beginning to pick up the pen, turn the page to a blank page, and begin to write the story of the rest of your life. And this is the beginning, the work of the serpent, shedding, emptying ourselves so we become an empty vessel. So one day you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, I don't know who you are, but I'll wash your face anyway. So that you become a mystery onto yourself. Now, if that happens in an Andean village, you're celebrated. If it happens in a Buddhist monastery where you no longer know who you are, Everybody applauds because you become a mystery. You can step into who you're becoming. You become that empty vessel. Whereas in the West, if you wake up one morning and you don't know who you are, you go into psychotherapy to discover who you are or you get medicated. So the idea is to become so vast 
and so empty of those stories. It's not that they go away. It's just that they stop choreographing the future. They stop selecting the partners and the people we meet and, and those people that we're irresistibly attracted to so that we can further the storyline. And these they call this karma. Shamans call it a tired old tale that we need to step out of. And we do this not only at the level of our lives individually and of our families and of our children. We want to offer them a new story, even a new story for the earth and for humanity. But we begin with our own story, shedding it the way the ser serpent sheds her skin. And we do that by putting it in the fire. Remember that to change our story, we need to change our mind. And if you can change your story, you'll change your life. And to change your mind, you need to change your brain. And the brain only changes through ceremony and particularly through fire ceremony, like we have done many, many times in this program, as well as in our many lifetimes where we sat around the fire and we did ceremony with fire. Remember that the world was lit only by fire for millions of years until a hundred years ago. Our lives were lit at night only by fire. So I invite you to do that, to put into the fire those parts of your life that you're ready to shed. Begin with the painful, difficult parts. Put them into the fire. Take your candle. Take your candle and your stick and blow into that stick. All of those challenging and difficult stories. All of those terrible times, all of the ways that you suffered, that you were hurt or abandoned or betrayed. And then if you, if you want, very carefully, you can follow along your energy body, burning the places where that story resides in your field. And beginning with the tragic and terrible stories. And then... <clears throat> gradually working your way to the positive stories, the beautiful stories, the beautiful things that happen to you. And you might be wondering, why should I put the beautiful stories into the fire? And that's because they continue to claim the present in a more beautiful way, in a gentler way, but in this limiting a way as the terrible stories do. And eventually after you have done the ceremony a number of times, you can put your name into the fire. You can put the name that was given to you into the fire, your first and your last name. So you become a mystery onto yourself. You become a mystery so that you can never explain yourself away by what you do, by your titles, your accolades, your diplomas, your failures, your successes. You become a mystery. And that's when you can become the author of an entirely new story. At that point, when you're not defined by anything, not by who you have been or by who you should have become or who you might have been, at that point, you can write whatever story you want and it becomes so because we are no longer encumbered by the past. You can become a dreamer, a man or a woman that dreams the world into being newly and that brings healing at the deepest core of your being because you're no longer trying to fix or repair. You're no longer working only on that book that's come already written. You're not doing editing any longer. After a while, the page gets messy. There's so many red marks and blue marks and erasure marks. You've begun writing that new book for yourself. And it's a new book that you will continue writing for your children and your children's children and for all of humanity. And 
for our planet that needs a new human story today. Let me know where you're calling in from, where you're listening from. Uh, go into the, into the, the uh, chat box and let me know what part of the world you're, you're dialing in from. I see that we have people from Sweden and we've got some folks from Australia and we have folks from Germany and the United States and Iceland. Iceland, wow. Let me know where you're listening in from and I send you blessings for a beautiful, beautiful weekend and a beautiful time during this extraordinarily challenging time that we're living. Thank you so much and I'll see you at the Shaman's View next week.